Hi, my name is Reed Johnson. I'm an associate professor at the Department of Entomology uh, at Ohio State University. Uh, and my work is on honeybees here in the state of Ohio. And I'm gonna talk to you today about some of the work we've been doing finding new tools uh, for varroa mite control, specifically chemical controls and how to come up with new, new pesticides to kill varroa mites within honeybee colonies. So an overview of what I'm gonna talk about is I'm gonna start off with the biology of the varroa mite and how it came to be a problem in our Western honeybees that we keep here in the United States. I'll go on and talk about the, the best current practices for monitoring and controlling varroa mites. And then I'll talk about some of the work we've been doing on developing new miticides, which is a challenging field, um, but I think is really required for the long-term success of beekeeping uh, in the state and in this country and potentially around the world. So I probably don't need to tell anyone uh, that, that honeybees are uh, in, in a precarious situation in this country. Uh, and that's really evident by the surveys uh, that are, are published each year by the Bee Informed Partnership, who have been asking beekeepers how many colonies they've been losing either in the winter or on an annual basis, going back to uh, the colony collapse disorder events of 2007. And you can see over time, we've got the, the annual losses in orange here, and they could be as high as 45%. Uh, while the summer and winter losses are somewhat less, as you'd expect. And even in, in 2019 and 2020, we had an average loss rate of, of just over 40% of colonies uh, from year to year, which is really, beekeepers have learned how to deal with this level of loss, but I still think it's unacceptable, and I think many beekeepers would agree. And certainly, things in Ohio have been no better than they've been at the national level. Uh, they keep statistics for the state level colony losses as well. And Ohio, while being not the worst in the, in the nation, uh, we lost about 42% of our colonies uh, over the, the year 2019 to 2020. This is of surveys of 125 of the beekeepers in the state, um, which represents a, a significant problem. Uh, and the, the question is, how much of these losses are due to varroa mite parasitism and how much are due to the other factors, you know, nutrition and pesticides and the other problems that are certainly relevant and facing uh, bees in the modern world. Um, but how much of that is varroa mites? And that's really a, a hard question to answer. Um, if you ask beekeepers, they would attribute about, you know, 40% of their losses to, to varroa mites. But there's lots of other problems they highlight as well. But I, I think varroa mites, if you ask commercial beekeepers, Varroa mites consistently top the list of their, their problems that they're having trouble dealing with. While they do know how to deal with them now, uh, the, the current strategies they're using are under threat and they may not continue to be effective in the future, which really underscores the need to develop new, uh, new, new products and new approaches to controlling varroa mites uh, in this country. So just I'll take a step back now and talk about some, some basic bee biology and I'm Imagine most of you know that there are the, the three different types of bees within a honeybee colony. You have one queen, uh, tens of thousands of workers, and then maybe several hundred drones, depending on the time of year. Um, and I bring that up because all, all four of the, all, all three of these uh, types of bees go through uh, complete metamorphosis, as do many insects. They start out as an egg, uh, develop as larvae, uh, undergo pupation underneath the wax capping uh, that the the other bees provide for them, and then eventually emerge as an adult. Um, and this developmental period varies depending on the, the type of bee that you're talking about. Queens develop quite rapidly, um, completing development to adulthood in only 16 days, while workers take somewhat longer, um, with 21 days, and drones are the laggards of the bunch, and they take 24 days to complete development. And a lot of that increased time in development is actually in the pupil stage. Um, they, they develop as larvae, you know, within a day of each other, but it's the, the drones spend a much longer time as pupae than the workers or the queens, certainly. So the, the honeybee population within a colony uh, undergoes growth and contraction over the course of the year. This is important when we're talking about varroa mites. They, they have a dormant phase. Well, I guess I should start over here since it's the fall. They have a dormant phase, which we're just entering now 
in, in uh, October and November, and populations are approaching a minimum as they will over the winter. And then in the spring, with the uh, you know spring flowers starting to bloom, the population will increase as the bees have got all those spring flowers to forage on and pollen and nectar coming in to feed uh, the nurse bees and feed developing brood. And then that population will peak sometime over the late spring or summer, and then we'll enter the population decrease phase, which really is what we're in now, before they enter the dormant period again. That's the course of uh, a, a year for a honeybee uh, colony. Now, there are a number of species of honeybees. We only keep um, and is only present in the United States is Apis mellifera, which is the European or Western honeybee. But there are a number of other species of bees that are out there. And this is important because Varroa mites did not start out being a problem in Apis mellifera, the bees that we keep. These came from another species of honeybee, Apis serrana. And if you look at the distribution of bee species throughout the world, uh, there are actually seven different bee species, and most of these are present in Southeast Asia. Um, and what happened is that the, you know, the European bee, uh, which we keep here, started out in Europe and Northern Africa, and then it's been distributed throughout the rest of the world um, as people, because it's so useful for honey production and for pollination, people have moved it uh, worldwide. So Varroa mites, Varroa destructor is the scientific name, have long been an ectoparasite of the Asiatic honeybee, Apis serrana, um, where they are not such a problem. Uh, they've got a long coevolutionary history together, Varroa destructor and Apis serrana, and the, uh, the parasite is not deadly to a, an Asiatic honeybee colony. And that's largely because they, the, these bees have strategies to deal with it, and the mite in Apis serrana really only attacks the drone brood which are useful for reproduction, but are not critical for the survival of that colony. And so uh, yeah, here's a representation of a Varroa mite. And if you want to get a, a nice close-up view of one of these, there's a, a nice 3D model um, available um, at, this, at this link, and you can manipulate that mite up way closer than you could ever see it in, in real life. Um, but this mite is, you know, not that big, really, from our perspective, but from the perspective of a, of a honeybee, this is a large, substantial parasite, and it can do some serious damage if it starts affecting workers, as it does in uh, European honeybees. So the host shift from Apis serrana to Apis mellifera happened out here in eastern Russia, uh, because the Russians brought in western honeybees from Europe, um, because those are the bees that they were keeping, um, and they brought them into the range of Apis serrana here in, in Asia. And when that happened, the Varroa mite uh, shifted hosts. Uh, it switched from Apis serrana to Apis mellifera, probably around 1900, but this was not detected until, you know, 1949. It was first reported in eastern Russia that they found these uh, Varroa mites on European bees where they had never been noticed before. And once it had made that host shift, um, first off, it, was, it was, has been devastating for bee, bees and beekeepers where it has uh, invaded. But by 1980, it had spread uh, west to Europe, into Africa, into other parts of, of Asia where Apis mellifera is kept. And it had also crossed the Atlantic and was present in South America. And by 1987, it had moved to North America probably uh, imported from, uh, based on, on uh, DNA analysis, it looks like it came from South America at this point, the first mites that were introduced to the U.S., and uh, really devastated the beekeeping industry here in North America. Uh, by 2012, it had been found in Hawaii, which had previously been varroa-free, and New Zealand. So currently, the only major region of the world where bees are kept uh, that is still varroa free is Australia. And I guess it's paradise to be a beekeeper in Australia. They only have all the other problems to deal with. So the varroa mite life cycle is kind of mysterious because you don't see a lot of it, which is the reason I want to go through it here. So mites are present in essentially every colony in the United States. And I think beekeepers should just assume that varroa mites are present uh, because they're, they're certainly endemic throughout the, the, 
the beekeeping and all bees have them at this point. But even if a colony is mite free, these mites can enter the colony by a drifting forager bee or potentially a robber bee that enters a, uh, a colony that is not its home colony. And these mites get tucked into the sclerites of this adult bee and can travel from colony to colony, just tucked up in here, uh, very safe from the environment. And that mite is feeding on the fat body uh, underneath here, which is this white material that you see. This is a uh, scanning electron micro, uh, micrograph uh, published by Sam, Sammy Ramsey at USDA. And really a, a beautiful image. He was the first to describe that these feed on fat body and really excellent work on how they uh, are surviving in the, uh, in the phoretics phase. Once those mites enter the colony, or they may already be present in a colony on adult bees, what they want to do is enter a cell for reproduction. And they enter, they're looking for late stage larvae, five to five and a half days old, just before that larva gets capped over. So a nice big fat one like this is what they're looking for. And what that mite will do is it will jump into that cell and it doesn't just hang out on the surface, it goes down to the very bottom of the cell and it hides out in the, the bit of uh, brood food that's down here at the bottom underneath this larva. And it can effectively hide out down there uh, and, and be mostly undetected by the nurse bees. Of course, this larva can't do anything because honeybee larvae are, are, are pretty much helpless. So it just hangs out in here waiting for this wax capping to get applied so that it has a nice little uh, nest for it that's nice and protected from the environment and from the nurse bees that might try to remove it. So after that wax capping has been applied by the nurse bees and this uh, larva stretches out into a prepupa, uh, this mother mite, who's previously mated, she will chew a hole in the side of this prepupa, a feeding hole, from which she will feed and all of her offspring will feed uh, in the subsequent days. So this uh, mother mite will lay her first egg uh, about 60 hours after the capping is applied, and that first egg is always a male. And so here we can see the male, and that male is feeding on the hole that the mother mite chewed through this, what is now a pupa. And then this mother mite lays subsequent eggs from one to five female eggs following that male egg. And those, those eggs develop from an egg into a protonymph and then a deuteronymph and then a full adult female. And they undergo this entire developmental, uh, all these developmental stages on this pupal mite underneath this wax capping. Um, and they're feeding, meanwhile, from this same hole that the mother mite chewed in this pupa. So the male was the first egg laid, and it will be the first to develop to adulthood. It also has a more brief developmental period. So it is, is fully mature and ready to mate after five or six days after that first egg is laid. Um, the adult females develop a little bit later. Um, but they have got a male to mate with immediately. They mate with their, their sibling, uh, still under this wax capping as this pupa is developing. Um, so at the end of this, you have a, a number of adult females that have been produced by this mother mite, and they are all mated uh, with their brother and ready to go out and invade new cells and uh, continue with reproduction. And so when this new young adult bee emerges from the wax capping, uh, she comes with, here's probably the mother mite, as well as several other mites that were able to uh, survive and, and uh, develop on this pupa. And then at this point, they can go off and find new cells to invade. Now, in Apis serrana, Varroa preferentially uh, infest drone brood. And they will prefer drone brood in Apis mellifera, our, our western honeybee as well. Um, and the reason mites prefer drones is because they have this longer developmental period uh, during which uh, the brood is capped over with wax and, they, and it is sealed. And what this allows is for this mother mite to lay at least one or two additional eggs and to crank out one or two additional offspring um, under this capped, uh, capped cell. Uh, while in workers, their reproductive output will be less. So this is the reason they really seek out drone brood. Uh, 
in Apis Serana and in Apis Mellifera, though in RBs they also will infest workers. So the problem here is um, that the, the Varroa mite population will peak kind of in a delayed fashion after the population peak in the honeybees, that's in this kind of orange here, the uh, Varroa mite population peaks after that because of course the Varroa mites have to reproduce on the brood. So it takes some time for their numbers to build up in a, in a bee colony. And so you have this peak occurring just as the honeybee population is starting to go into the population decrease in the, in the fall. And what this does is, you may have noticed in your own colonies over the last several months, suddenly there were no mites on your adult bees, and then suddenly they're everywhere. And that's because you suddenly have way more mites than there are brood for those mites to invade, because of course the bees are in a population decrease and they've, they've really shut down brood rearing. And so you have a lot of adult mites with no place to go, and they suddenly become very evident to you. And this is a real problem because these uh, bees that are being reared during this period in the, in the fall, late summer and fall, are the bees that will need to survive the winter period. Um, and if essentially every bee that's developing during this period is infested with a varroa mite, that's going to be a real problem. Those, those bees are going to be really um, compromised in their ability to survive the upcoming winter. And this is when you get populations crashing usually in you know, November or December, a severely infested uh, colony uh, won't even make it to the new year in many cases. And here's another representation. This is from a, an article by Kirsten Trainer that she just published this year. And I think it is a really beautiful representation of the life cycle of both the bees and the varroa mites within the colony. So you know, here we have um, the winter coming into early spring. And you can see that during the spring period, most of those mites are on the drones in the, in the, uh, in the honeybee colony because, again, drones are their, really their preferred uh, host. It's, and relatively few are in the worker brood. Now, later in the season, when drone rearing ceases, you'll see more and more of those mites in the worker brood. And then you'll start to see some in the adults as well. And this is a problem because um, the beekeeper, and even if you're using sampling methods, like uh, which I'll show you in a minute, um, you're unlikely to see many mites on adult bees in the early and mid-summer. It's only in the late summer, uh, as brood rearing really starts to decrease and the bees start to rear bees that will need to overwinter, um, you'll start to see more and more on the adult bee population. Um, and by you know fall, most of the mites are on the adult bee population. In late fall, when there is no brood, the entire mite population is on the uh, adult bees. And this really generates a disconnect between the mites that we're observing as beekeepers early in the season and the mites that are actually in the colony because they're hidden underneath those wax cappings where we can't see them, we can't monitor them, and it's more challenging to treat for them. And of course, uh, these varroa mites the damage they really do is by transmitting bee viruses from bee to bee and from colony to colony. Uh, there are currently 32 known named bee viruses, and of those 10 are associated with varroa mite parasitism. The most uh, clear association and probably the most severe effects are this deformed wing virus that cause these characteristic deformed wings at a severe level, though they can cause reduced lifespan and uh, other problems at lower levels. And I just want to stress that Varroa is really a community problem. Uh, you may not be treating for Varroa mites in your colonies, uh, or maybe you are, and you get reinfested by your neighbors uh, that are not treating for Varroa mites because these mites can definitely move around as bees move around within the landscape uh, through robbing events or through, through natural drifting. Uh, the bees will carry the mites with them from colony to colony. So even though your, your colony may be relatively varroa free today, that, that may not last because you could get an influx of mites from a collapsing colony somewhere else or from a, uh, your bees robbing out a weak colony, dying from varroa mite parasitism somewhere else. And so they can move around the landscape uh, fairly effectively. So uh, if, if you want a real practical resource for monitoring and managing 
varroa mites and honeybees, I, I strongly recommend you take a look at this Tools for Varroa Management that's been published by the Honeybee Health Coalition. It's regularly revised, but it was first written by uh, Dewey Karen, a retired professor from the University of Delaware. Um, and this is really the, the go-to guide for varroa mite issues in beekeeping with real uh, usable practical advice. So I, I recommend you check out their website at the Honeybee Health Coalition. Uh, org slash varroa to get a copy of this uh, this guide. They have some other resources. You of course can get an app on your phone to help you um, understand and monitor and react to the varroa that are in your colony. Um, and really, what this is all based on is the principles of integrated pest management. And this is really the ideal of what we want to be doing in beekeeping. Uh, this is. Uh, often abbreviated as IPM, Integrated Pest Management. And this involves a combination of tactics. Uh, first off, you need to know your pest levels. And this is not just for varroa mites, this is for pests uh, that may be in any agricultural crop. Step one is to know your problem, know what the levels are, and then to use non-chemical controls whenever that's possible. And if non-chemical controls are not possible, or they're not going to be effective in your situation, then you will need to use a pesticide, but only when they exceed a damaging threshold. And then you need to combine your tactics into a comprehensive yearly plan of what you're going to do throughout the year. And it's probably a number of actions that you're going to need to take. You're going to need to monitor your varroa mites levels uh, in the summer, uh, possibly integrate that with uh, drone brood removal or some other early uh, tactic, uh, and maybe some pesticide applications uh, in the summer or in the fall to keep your varroa mite uh, populations under control uh, and integrate this into an integrated pest management plan. So that's the ideal. Um, but it's really challenging to monitor for varroa mites, and I think this is where a lot of, uh, certainly we get hung up here, is that uh, monitoring for for mites is, is difficult. And I think even if you can't monitor for your for varroa mites, you just need to assume that they're there and that they're gonna cause a problem and that you need to uh, manage your colonies as if they have a varroa mite problem if you are not going to monitor your mite levels um, and implement this kind of uh, comprehensive IPM plan. So there are a number of methods that you can use for monitoring varroa mite levels in a, in a honeybee colony. I've got a number of them listed here, and I'm going to go through these uh, over the next few slides. Um, one of the ones that I like uh, is the sugar shake, um, because it can actually give you quantitative numbers, number of mites per 100 bees. It's relatively easy to perform. It doesn't require a lot of equipment. And it has the added advantage of not actually killing any of the bees. So in the event that you get your queen, in the bees that you sample, it's not going to be catastrophic for your colony. So if you only have a one or two colonies, I think the, the sugar shake is probably the way to go um, because uh, it really limits the damage that you can do to your, to your apiary. And it just takes about 300 bees, which is about a third or a half a cup of bees, and you can measure those out uh, with a, a, actually a, a measuring cup. And you put them in a mason jar like this, and then you add in maybe two tablespoons of powdered sugar on top, uh, filter that through the, uh, the, the jar here so the bees get coated. And the powdered sugar, in combination with the heat that these bees are generating, will cause the, the mites to lose a grip on their, their bee hosts, uh, and they'll fall off and can then be uh, shaken off the bees and counted. And here's an image of, of the shake. Um, I should mention that after you coat them with, uh, with powdered sugar, it's best to let that jar just sit there for a few minutes so the bees get good and dusty, generate some good heat uh, to knock those varroa mites off, and then you shake them onto a piece of paper or a, a wash bin is what we use. And you need to shake this thing vigorously in order to get those mites off, more vigorously than you might expect, and shake it for a, a good 20 seconds to get a good number of mites off of those bees. And then you can count the, the mites that fall off your bees, uh, and divide that by 300, and that will give you the number of mites per bee. And there, hopefully you don't see this when you do that, because that is really just a horrific level of mites in this particular sample. Um, in research situations, and really commercial beekeepers are more, more likely to use the alcohol wash method. 
Um, this does kill the 300 bees that you put into a jar here. So you add the same, you know, a third to a half a cup of bees plus 70% uh, alcohol. This can be uh, isopropyl alcohol or ethanol or rubbing alcohol or whatever you have. Uh, it kills the bees. And this allows you to do your counts at a later date if you're collecting a large number of samples uh, at one time. Uh, there's also this uh, easy check that's sold uh, by the bee supply companies, uh, which is a, just another version of the mason jar that we have here. Uh, and then you, you uh, wash those, those bees into a jar, shake it vigorously, and then strain out the liquid, and the mites will come with the liquid uh, if you have a screen over the top, and the bees will, will remain inside, and you can do a count of the mites per 100 bees again. Uh, there are also some more qualitative, some more passive methods that you can use to evaluate the kind of the, a more general, broad definition of the, the mite levels that are in your colony. One method that many beekeepers like is the screen bottom board, uh, which has this screen on the bottom, and then you have a sticky card below that, and the mites uh, will just naturally drop off the bees uh, sometimes and fall on this sticky card below. You can just pull this card out and do a count of the mites that are on this board. Or really, this is kind of just a, a, a general check. Are there a lot of mites here, or are there a few mites here? And that can help you guide your management decisions in a more, kind of a more general way. If you have solid bottom boards, and, and we have solid bottom boards on the bees we keep here at, the, at OSU, an alternative method you can do is you can get some of these uh, file folders. If anyone still has file folders, maybe you've got some old file folders you're looking to get rid of. Um, you can smear these with Vaseline uh, with your hive tool and just put this on the bottom board uh, of your colony and leave it there for 24 hours or 48 hours and come back and pull this thing back out and count the number of mites that dropped onto this, uh, this sticky card that you've made. Uh, the Vaseline uh, won't really trap many bees. Uh, they're, they're, they're capable of getting out of the Vaseline if they get stuck to it, but the mites can't and they'll stick to this, uh, this uh, card down here and you can uh, count the number uh, that fall onto that, that uh, file folder. Another qualitative method is uncapping brood. And one of the reasons I like this approach is that it's actually getting at where the problem is. The mites, for most of the year, are really underneath as, these wax cappings. So one way you can assess the population of mites under the cappings is by taking a capping scratcher and just pulling out as much brood as you can get with one pull. And then inspecting these, these pupae for mites uh, just visually. You can also pull out uh, worker brood in a more quantitative way. We've done this for research before, but this is a lot of work uh, because the mites like drone brood, and drone brood is honestly a little kind of expendable. It's nice, a nice way to just pull out some drone brood and, and take a look at it for mites. And then you, if you see a lot of mites, then you can take action. If you don't see any, then you know you're, you're probably okay. The one thing you don't want to do is attempt to observe mites on adult bees. Um, this is essentially useless because it's very, very hard to observe mites on adult bees because they're tucked in here uh, in the abdominal uh, sclerites, and you're not going to see them unless you've really got a catastrophic level of mite infestation, and then they will become to be visible. Uh, and by that point, it's so bad that the colony, it's going to be very difficult to salvage the colony. So we've got our, our methods here. We've got the quantitative methods, the qualitative methods, and the not useful method of observing mites on adult bees. Now, if you do one of these quantitative methods, uh, then you can take a look at a, a, a chart uh, and, and evaluate the levels based on um, recommendations. So we did a survey a few years ago about the methods that beekeepers in Ohio are using. Uh, many people use screen bottom boards, which can be very effective, or, or powdered sugar shake, or alcohol wash. Um, but it was disconcerting to see the proportion of, of hobbyist beekeepers and including some sideliner beekeepers who only use observing mites on adult bees, which is really not an effective method uh, of, of evaluating the level of varroa infestation in your, in your colonies. So back to IPM, we need to know our pest levels, then use non-chemical or chemical controls as justified and combine this into a yearly plan. So now we need to control these mites and uh, there are a number of ways to control mites in, in honeybee colonies. Uh, probably the, the most attractive way is to use stocks of bees that have been bred or selected for resistance to varroa mites. And this could include the, the Russian bees that have been imported 
um, from Russia, where they've had over 100 years of coevolution with viromite parasitism, and they now have evolved some level of resistance uh, to mites, and they're, they're much better able to tolerate mite parasitism on their own. Um, there are also cultural controls, and I'll go over a few of those, and then pesticides. So breeding for varroa resistance, I mentioned these Russian bees already, but there's also uh, bees that have been developed by the uh, USDA Baton Rouge lab that, that uh, ex exhibit varroa-specific hygiene. Uh, a number of others have been uh, selected for hygienic behavior or grooming behavior. Most famous of those at the moment are the, the Purdue ankle biters, which uh, uh, demonstrate um, aggressiveness toward the mites and will, will chew them off and will uh, chew, the, uh, chew the legs of the mites off. And that's, that's a good uh, method of resisting these mites, even though it may not be the entire solution. And beekeepers, even if you have uh, bees that you that have been bred for resistance, you should still monitor your levels and you may need to treat if the levels get high because uh, if there's a lot of mite pressure in your area, these your, your bees may not have the genetic capacity to overcome incoming mites from elsewhere. Um, cultural controls that are useful. Uh, I especially like drone bird removal. And this is where you just put these green drone frames. This one's not green, but many of them are uh, with the drone sized cells into your colonies. And the queen will lay drone eggs in here, and you'll, you'll quickly get a slab of, of drone brood uh, if you're doing this in the, in the uh, spring or in the early summer when the bees are rearing drones. And you can just pull this out of your colony and pop that in the freezer, uh, and you'll kill all the mites. Of course, the drones will die too. Um, but this is, can be a very effective uh, way to control mites without using any sort of chemicals. Um, and it's, it's quite effective uh, among beekeepers who use it. Uh, and, and use it um, continuously. Another way you can, you can manage mites is by splitting colonies. Uh, this is one way that can be effective. If you're constantly splitting your colonies, that will uh, cause a brood break. If you're adding in a new queen, there will be a break in brood production. And that break in brood production is really critical for um, slowing down the mites' reproductive trajectory, and you can uh, reduce the number of mites that will build up in the colony by the end of the year. And then, of course, there are the chemical controls if uh, and when these other methods don't work. Um, and there are both natural and synthetic chemicals that are currently on the market. Um, the natural ones include things like uh, Apigard, which contains thymol and other essential oils, uh, Hopgard, which is actually a byproduct of uh, the beer brewing industry um, containing hops beta acids, which shows reasonable effectiveness, though it's not one of the best products. And then there are the organic acids, uh, oxalic acid. This is in a trickle here. You can also use that in a, a vaporization uh, formulation. Or formic acid formulated in Mitoway quick strips or in Formic Pro, or there are some other methods to apply formic acid with, uh, with homemade formulations, though I I personally don't like dealing with formic acid, so I, I just buy the formic pro. There are also synthetic uh, chemicals for controlling varroa. Uh, apistan and apivar are the two that are, are most widely available now, and these can be effective, um, uh, largely because they are resident in the colony for quite some time, and they, they contain a synthetic uh, miticide that will kill um, the mites over a, a long period of time as that strip hangs in the colony. Um, so if you, if you look at the Honeybee Health Coalition's tools for varroa management, um, they have recommendations on what you should use, uh, which ones are highly useful, oxalic acid, formic acid, uh, thymol, amitraz, and apistan, though that's only regional. Uh, there are regions where apistan no longer works. Um, and then there are some that are moderately useful, such as drone brood removal and hop guard, screen bottom boards. And then there are some that are not useful and really beekeepers should not be using them for varroa mite control. So here's just kind of a, a schedule of approaches that I think is appropriate for us here in Ohio, going from uh, winter, we've just out, we're out applying oxalic acid now that the colonies are, are really getting fairly broodless. Um, but in the spring, you have a whole number of options, apivar, thymol, uh, or apivar, or mito quick strips, or formic pro, or drone brood removal. Into summer, these continue to be effective. 
Uh, Hopguard 2 is a nice option during the honey flow. And then again, in the autumn, oxalic acid uh, uh, going through into the winter. But it's not like there's one silver bullet here. And that maybe that's a good thing because it forces beekeepers to mix up their approaches um, for managing varroa mites. But there are really a number of problems with these current chemical treatments. Um, so a number of them can't be used when honey supers are on. Apivar and apistan can't be used because the label uh, prohibits their use when honey supers are on for human consumption because we don't want these synthetic pesticides getting into honey that we're going to be eating or selling to people to eat. Uh, thymol you don't want to use when honey is on because it can contaminate the honey and make it taste like thymol, uh, which isn't good. Uh, formic acid is problematic because it can't be used, it's, it's, it's temperature sensitive, and it can't be used in either, particularly in hot temperatures, but it will become ineffective in cold temperatures. So you have to wait for the right day in order to apply formic acid. And then oxalic acid isn't effective when brood is present, which is the reason I'm only recommending doing that really in the, in the fall and winter periods when the colonies are broodless, because if there's brood present, uh, those mites are all hiding out in the brood and oxalic acid will not affect them. The other problem, and I, I guess this kind of ties into some of the problems with, with oxalic acid, is that most of the mites are under the capping most of the year. And these mites are essentially invisible to our best monitoring methods, the alcohol wash and the sugar shake, because we're only sampling, if you go out and do a, a mite wash in the early summer, you're only sampling this portion of the, the population of bees. This population, which are the brood, you're not sampling at all with an alcohol wash, but that's where all the mites are. So you really don't get an accurate number sampling uh, during much of the year with an alcohol wash or sugar shake. And I think um, we really need to develop some new approaches to monitoring mites that might be more informative. Additionally, these mites that are under wax cappings are protected from many of the miticides that we're using. And the reason things like apivar and, and uh, uh, apistan are effective is, well, number one, they do have some ability to cross the wax cappings. But I think the, the bigger reason they're effective is because these are strips that remain in the hive for over 12 days. That's over a brood cycle, or at least over the period during which all of the brood will become uncapped and will emerge. Um, so all of the bees in the colony will be exposed to these things as that strip hangs, hangs in there and continues to um, have the miticide present in the colony. And that's not the case with flash treatments like uh, oxalic acid. And it can be an issue with formic acid as well, even though formic acid can, can better cross the wax cappings than, than some other molecules. Um, but I think it's a real problem and we don't have a great solution for getting these mites that are under the wax cappings. And it sure would be great if we had a better way of getting in there uh, and getting rid of those, those mites where they're really causing the problems hiding out under the wax. And the, the final problem with current treatments is that they are really experiencing reduced effectiveness, reduced usefulness, because the varroa have evolved resistance. And this has kind of put beekeepers on a pesticide treadmill, the same treadmill much of agriculture has been on. Um, and so we had apistan and it worked great through the 1990s, but by the late 90s, uh, apistan resistance was, was rampant in varroa populations. Now that seems to have disappeared to some extent in some populations. And I think it might be time for beekeepers to continue, con consider using apistan again, uh, if it works in your, in your cycle of, of treatments. Um, but resistance is going to reemerge if we use it heavily. There's no question about that. Uh, and the, the product to replace apistan was check mite, um, which the, the, bee, the mites evolved resistance in just a few years after check mite use started. And as far as I understand, they still have widespread resistance to this product. So I don't recommend anyone go and use, use check mite at this time. Um, and then apivar, which contains amitraz, a formamidine, uh, this paper by Frank Rinkovich at, at USDA um, reported there is widespread resistance to amitraz in commercial beekeepers' call, uh, apiaries, uh, particularly in apiaries where beekeepers are heavily using amitraz. Um, so we, we really kind of hang under the, this, this cloud is hanging over beekeeping right now that uh, the number of years for which apivar may continue to be useful is probably limited 
and that we really should not be depending on amitraz as our sole uh, synthetic miticide. And unfortunately, that's the case for many commercial beekeepers, uh, not really in Ohio, but the big national beekeepers uh, that are migratory, many of them really do rely on amitraz for varroa control because their, their, their timing and their, their, their business doesn't really allow them to use some of these other methods. So we really need to find something similarly effective to apivar, but that's not apivar and maybe doesn't have some of the problems that apivar or amitraz have. And so the problem with resistance is, and this is, this is the reason that, am, that uh, apistan quit working back in the 90s, is that was the only thing beekeepers were using for many years. Um, and so, you know, if you uh, treat a, an insecticide, an insect population or a mite population, um, before you first use a miticide or an insecticide, uh, you probably already have some resistance background in the population. And this is true of all pests. There's always a handful that are going to be resistant to whatever you throw at them. So with that first use, you get excellent control because most of the population is resistant. But if you continue using that same product year after year, and it's your only approach to controlling your pest, um, this resistant population will build up over time after repeated insecticide use because they're the only ones surviving, um, they're able to reproduce and outreproduce the susceptible population. And therefore, after five or six uses, you have essentially 100% resistant population. And what was formerly a great insecticide or a miticide is now no longer effective. And that's, that's usually the pattern. If you heavily use something for, for four or five years, it's not going to be effective anymore. So new chemical varroa treatments are needed. In addition to, you know, continued uh, breeding for varroa tolerant stocks and really increased use of the cultural controls like splitting colonies or drone bird removal. But I think for a balanced program, for us to really successfully implement IPM on a broad scale, we're going to need new, new chemical varroa treatments as the backstop for these other methods uh, when they're not effective or effective enough for, for beekeepers to be successful. And it's a real challenge to find new chemical varroa treatments because very few compounds are selective for varroa and safe for bees. It's been said, it's tough to kill a bug on a bug. And that is absolutely true because there's not a long list of compounds that are going to be toxic to varroa, but safe for bees. And there's always the concerns about uh, applicator safety as well as purity of honey and not poisoning honey consumers. So whatever this varroa treatment is, it needs to be at least acceptable uh, to use in honeybee colonies. And we, we may need to use it in a way where it also does not contaminate honey. So I think these are achievable. They're hard, but they're achievable. Um, but the, one of the bigger problems is that it's just so expensive to register a new pesticide and bring it to market in the modern world. It costs millions and millions of dollars in testing just to be able to register a new pesticide um, because there is a whole lot of tests that needs to be done to make sure that it's going to be environmentally safe and that it's not going to kill people. Um, and those tests all cost a lot of money and the, the regulatory process to get something approved is lengthy and expensive. And the, the, the reality is a lot of the big chemical companies that are developing new products for use in, you know, say corn or cotton or soybeans, where there's a huge market, uh, they really have very little interest in developing new varroa mite treatments because beekeeping is frankly a niche market. There's not, you know, there's only 2.6 million honeybee colonies in the entire United States. Uh, and unless you're going to pay $100 per mite treatment, it's very difficult for them to recoup the, the cost of uh, the registration and development uh, for a new product. So they're not interested in losing money. And as a result, they're not interested in developing new varroa mite treatments. Um, so really, the, the, the way around this problem down here, the, the cost of registration, is to find existing miticides that are already registered or already have some registration data that's been assembled um, that could be used and it could be just a, a change in formulation or a change in the label that might allow them to then be used for varroa mite control. The other route around that is to find natural products which have reduced registration costs generally 
Um, these natural products could be, you know, extracts from plants or other naturally derived compounds that might be effective against uh, varroa mites. So this, these are really the, the key places that we're, we're looking when researching for new chemical controls. It's not going to be a new molecule that a, a chemist is developing in a lab somewhere. It's going to be something that's already on the shelf somewhere that we can repurpose for varroa mite control purposes. And so that's what we've been doing for the last several years. And this is a project that was funded by the Foundation for Food and Agricultural Research, or FFAR. Um, and this was a, a project called a Pipeline for Streamlined Development and Testing of Novel Controls for the Honeybee Parasitic Mite Varroa Destructor. And there's a whole host of, of PIs. This was led by Stephen Cook uh, at USDA Beltsville, um, as well as researchers all across the country, including Canada and a researcher in Spain. And basically what we did is we put our heads together and talked with uh, uh, people in industry to generate a list of potential compounds that we should test for their, their, their potential to be used for varroa mite control in beehives. And then the goal was just to, to test all these compounds that we had, had generated from this brainstorming session. And my involvement was really in doing the laboratory testing of this suite of, of potential varroa mite controls. And the way we did that is we, we uh, coated these little glass vials, these are called 20 milliliter scintillation vials, and we coated them with our miticide of interest. Uh, we put them on the lab hot dog roller. This is just a standard hot dog roller that you might use for, for cooking hot dogs. Um, but it, when you turn it on, it rolls these vials around and around so that we can put a pesticide in here and it will coat the walls of this vial. And then after that's dried, we just throw in five or 10 varroa mites into this vial um, and then feed them with a pupa from a honeybee colony and then look to see uh, over the course of several days uh, how many of those mites make it. And then we have a, a whole dose response curve here set up. As you can see in this trial, we have a control on the left and increasing concentrations as you move to the right. And the goal here is to Hopefully none of the mites die in the control treatment. All of them die in the highest level treatment. And we get a nice increase in the number of mites dying as you increase the concentration of the, the pesticide. And we did similar tests on the bees. This time, again, we put them on our, our trusty hot dog roller and we coated these larger mason jars with the pesticide. And then we just put uh, 20 bees into this jar uh, gave them a sugar water feeder, and then evaluated the, the survival of the bees over the course of three days to see if, to, to, to evaluate the differential between the toxicity of this compound to bees and to mites. And then we can put that on a, a chart like this, and this was uh, work we did with lithium chloride, which has been suggested as a mite control agent. Um, there was a, a group in Germany that uh, actually has patented this, uh, using lithium chloride as a varroa mite control, but we, we include it in our tests as a, as a check. And on the right here, we have the honeybee toxicity, and this is the dose response curve for, for uh, bees. And over here, we have the mites. And you can see there's a large difference between these two, and that's exactly what we want to see in a prospective miticide. We want to see very low bee toxicity, which we have here, and very high mite toxicity. So we've got a really excellent margin of safety for adult bees with lithium chloride. Now it is well known, and the, the uh, inventors uh, noted that, that lithium chloride is highly toxic to brood. Um, so it, it, it has some problems there. But as far as adult bees go, lithium chloride looks like it could be an effective uh, miticide, at least on adult bees, though it would have problems uh, being applied in a whole colony. So I don't recommend anyone go buy lithium chloride. You're probably going to kill your colony with that stuff. But if you just have some adult bees sitting around and no brood, uh, maybe it could be effective. So we, we did all of this uh, mite and bee testing, and we set up this kind of decision tree on the 30 compounds that went into the process uh, from the mite vial testing and the bee vial, bee jar testing. And we, we compared the bee toxicity to the mite toxicity. And that's how we ranked our compounds. Um, and to, 
with some other considerations as well, such as the availability of the material. And we rank this from top to bottom, which are the most promising compounds and which really probably don't deserve to be looked at any further. And I can tell you, a lot of the compounds we looked at, they, they don't need to be tested any further. They're, they either had very little mite toxicity or they had unacceptably high B toxicity, and they're just going nowhere. Uh, they would be really bad candidates for using in a bee colony. And the next step in this process was they, we chose the five best compounds, and we did uh, cage testing on that. And we actually had uh, bees, there are bees in this uh, wooden cage from uh, colonies with a uh, uh, mite infestation in them. And then we give them some sugar water to feed on them, and we apply a plastic strip inside this cage on which we've applied the, the candidate compound. And then the bees come into contact with this strip, and then we can count the mites that drop off here to evaluate whether this is actually going to work potentially in practice. Uh, are, the, are the bees alive at the end of this process? Are there mites that are dead? Um, is it worth uh, taking this to a, a full field trial, which is the final stage? And we're only testing one or two compounds at the field level. And really the challenge here is how do you formulate these compounds so that they can be applied in a, in a, a bee colony and will be present long enough to apply this over that 12 day period that we need to coat the bees uh, so we get all the bees, nobody can hide out under the wax cappings. Um, in this case, this was a trial we did a few years ago, and we used just a, a paper towel soaked with some, some oil to apply it in this case. And you can see over the course of 10 days, the bees uh, were exposed. So there are lots and lots of problems with developing a new miticide. And it's, it's uh, humbling, actually, uh, to overcome some of these because it's not an easy project developing one of these things. Uh, we, we still are concerned about the safety uh, for honey. We still need to worry about brood toxicity because uh, that's only going to be really become evident when we uh, apply these in full colonies. We've done no testing with queens, but hopefully they don't kill the queens, though that should be become evident in full colonies as well. Uh, formulation is always a problem. How can we find something that will be both shelf-stable, easy to apply, and will last in the colony for long enough to, uh, to expose all the bees uh, without anybody sneaking out under the wax cappings. And then finally, finding somebody to register and sell this product is also a problem. Uh, oxalic acid was registered by USDA. It's the first pesticide that USDA has registered, um, but they don't market it. They had to find somebody else. Uh, Brushy Mountain was marketing it for a while. Uh, it, it's, fine. it's hard to find someone who's, who's going to be willing to, to register and market these products if they finally come to fruition. So, a lot of problems, but I think it's worth the, the effort to find new ways to control bees, uh, mites in bee colonies, because we're going to need to find new ways uh, to control them if, if, if resistance is going to become an issue. And it's really a required component if we're going to take an IPM approach to beekeeping, um, which is, I hope, what we do in the future. So if you have any questions, my, my uh, email address was at the beginning of this talk, but I'm happy to uh, if, feel free to email me, and I'm happy to uh, answer your questions. And Mr. Reed. Hello. Thank you for it. That was a great presentation. Well, thank you. Frustrating yeah. topic. I guess uh, the theme of the, the morning has been Varroa mites. But, um, <laughs> so. All right. I got a question for you. Go ahead, B. Okay. This is um, a call-in question. How many beehives are killed annually due to pesticide kill? Due to pesticide kill, I mean, that, that's a difficult question to answer. I don't actually know. It's, it's a relatively small number where the, the, uh, there was a misapplication of a pesticide and it can be directly related to a colony dying, obviously. Um, I, I'd say it's probably just a handful each year. I think the bigger issue is that there's a lot of probably underreporting and that, that maybe bee colonies are getting exposed to pesticides at lower levels that don't outright kill them, but may have other negative effects on the health of the colony and that, that they fail to thrive then throughout the, the rest of the year because, um, because of that pesticide exposure. So I, I, that's not a very good answer, but um, I, I really don't know the, the answer to that. All right, we have another call in question, or uh, I guess a question that came online that you haven't got to. Do you know of any products or techniques that are coming down the line? 
Well, I saw someone did mention RNAi on there, and I believe that uh, Bayer now is continuing to develop that. Uh, there was an Israeli company that was purchased by Monsanto, and then Monsanto was bought by Bayer. So there's a almost a decade of research that's gone into that RNAi approach now, and I haven't heard um, pretty tight-lipped about it. I haven't heard any announcements when that's coming to market or uh, how effective it, it, it is. It, it was quite promising early on, but I don't know anything more about that. Um, other products, this, uh, we were chatting in the, in the chat box about the uh, oxalic acid with glycerin in a kind of a shop towel formulation. Um, I think this is kind of a new use for oxalic acid that might be more useful during uh, the brood rearing season in the you know, spring, summer, and, and early fall. Um, there is a commercially available product in other countries, and I think that they're looking at, uh, I can't recall the name of this product at the moment, but it, it could be there will be a new product uh, with this oxalic acid and glycerin that, that will be coming on the market relatively soon. That will probably be the new, new, first new product that we get. Um, though there are questions about its efficacy, that, that oxalic acid plus glycerin appears to be uh, more effective in drier climates. I know that Randy Oliver has had good success with it in California, but the tests that I've heard of in, in Alabama and Michigan, it has not been very successful uh, when applied during the summer months. Okay, this is going to be our last question for Dr. Johnson. There is much talk about how academic literature does not publish failures. Do you document what doesn't work for others so they don't repeat the work? Well, this is this is a problem throughout all of all of science is that it uh, the, the the failures are underreported, um, and, and that's a that's a perfectly valid criticism that we don't publish enough on that. I, I think a lot of it does get communicated within meetings. It's not just in the scientific literature. Uh, the bee research community is relatively small, and we do talk to each other quite a bit. Um, so even if it doesn't ever get published, people know what did and did not work because often that gets presented at meetings and we, we try to keep up with what everyone else is doing. 